I'm excited about this day, especially when I heard uh, from when Pastor Ranjit said that this is the Women's uh, Celebration Day. Amen? Can I hear the loudest shout of hallelujah from the women? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! All right. So it's a beautiful day indeed. And once again, I'm so honored. This is my honor to speak to you again. Um, I can't uh, imagine that it has been one year, you know. Can I move this a little bit here? So I can. So I can walk and I can see your faces. So it's been one year since the last time that I was here. And it's always a joy to come to your church. Amen. This is the church of the Lord. You're part of the body. And this is the way we fellowship with one another. Lifting up the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So Pastor Ranjit asked me to preach about the presence of God. Can you tell the person sitting beside you the presence of God? Huh? Something marvelous. Whenever we speak of the presence of God, it's like, what is that, Lord? I want to be there, right? We want to be in the presence of God. But the good news for today is that you will know the progression of ourselves in terms of being in the presence of God. All right? The Bible tells us, so when, when, uh, when Pastor Ranjit said, Pastor Lillette, can you speak about this? And then it made me into thinking that the Bible tells us it is consistent, that the presence of God is constant. Can you say constant? Through his word, he confirmed that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is always our very present help in our every need. Amen? Amen. So God has already done his part. Can you tell the person sitting beside you, God has already done his part. His presence is all over us. And mind you, even if we haven't met God, His presence is already overwhelming us. Only because we were not aware about it. Alright? So today, the Lord has given this word from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. So this is the word of the Lord. And I will be taking as well some uh, scripture from chapter 2 of the same First John, the letter of John, all right? So as I was saying, that the presence of God immediately becomes apparent to us. The presence of God is already there, right? But it immediately becomes apparent to us. We get to know that. We become aware of His presence, the presence, the moment we meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. So His glorious presence in our lives, God is already there. The question is what and where we are in that equation. So let us read 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. It says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Continue. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. The last verse says, let the it says there that we write this to make our joy complete. So let us pray. I believe that the Lord has opened your hearts, your spiritual ears as well, so that the Word of God can really get inside of us. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the power of your Word. We thank you, Lord, that your Word challenges us. It arrests, Lord God, all the issues in our hearts. And I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that through your grace and through your Holy Spirit, who teaches us all things, allowing us to know the deepest things about you, has already opened our hearts today. Father, I thank you, you alone, 
will be glorified today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, John here is pertaining to what we have. Can we go back to uh, first verse 1? All right. So, John here, the Apostle John. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which is past tense, which we have seen with our eyes, which we, we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning what? Concerning the word of life. So the Apostle John here is pertaining to what we already have. Can you say what I already have? What I already have. And that is the word of life. Who is the word of life? Jesus. So John here is talking to born again believers. John here is talking to you, right? Because you are already aware of what you have received. You have heard, you have seen, you have experienced Jesus in our lives. So today, I'd like us to focus on three words and I'd like you to take note of that, all right? One is relationship, which is discovering the presence of God. Discovering. So one is relationship, which is discovering the presence of God. Number two is fellowship. Enjoying and experiencing the presence of God. And the last one in this progression of experiencing and getting to know the presence of God is maturity and spiritual growth which is experiencing and exercising the presence of God so what are those three one is relationship so it talks about being aware being able to discover the presence of God in our lives and then second fellowship it is being able to experience and enjoy the presence of God and the last one is maturity this is staying, exercising, and allowing the presence of God to manifest in our lives, okay? So let me deal with relationship first. You are very familiar with this, being a born-again Christian. So Apostle John was, has made it clear what, with the act of relationship, with the word of life, Jesus, result from a moment of choice when we deliberately when we willingly and said, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. From today onwards, you are now my Lord and my Savior. So this is the start of the relationship with the word of life, who is Jesus. And as the gospel tells us, we are translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. This is from Colossians 113 you don't need to go there but this is what happens this is the process that the moment you accept the lord god jesus in your life you have changed you entered into a relationship so we receive him we accept christ and we invite him to enter in our life and the result is a new union that is your unity with jesus christ who has the unity with god the father Amen? Basically, this is what we've been hearing as well, the consistency of God's word today. Reassuring us, allowing us to know the very important relationship that God has given us. So this is the relationship, our discovery of the presence of God in our lives. I myself, I was not aware that God was all ever present. I was 22 years old when I met the Lord. So from Day one of my life, until the age of 22, I was ignoring the very presence of God in my life. I became aware and discovered the very strong, mighty presence of God only when I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, John makes it clear that in the last chapter, okay, because wh why do you think people, the unbelievers, were not aware of the presence of God at that time? Why were you not aware of the presence? Maybe you say, I know God. I know God. But you still do not have relationship with Him. 
It is because people prior to accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior is all about focusing on themselves. Whether you are thinking highly of yourself, saying, you know, I can do this. I can, I can go to heaven through my good works. So you are thinking highly of yourself or you are thinking lowly of yourself. You are saying that, um, I do not deserve God's love. I am a sinner. How can I attend that church where holy people are? So there are only two things we view ourselves. We think highly or we think of ourselves as lowly uh, human beings. But that has changed. Yes, that's correct. We are sinners, but that was our perception before. When we meet the Lord, we know how the Lord sees us. That He accepts us how, no matter how dirty we were. And He is so willing to cleanse us with His own pure blood. Amen? Amen. All right. So that is um, relationship. Our discovery of the very presence of God in our lives. And this is something that I do not need to expound on. Because we, we met the Lord, right? You're all born again here. Who is born again question here? All right? So from today, we understand that having a relationship of God is discovering the presence of Him in our lives. So the Christian life, but we have to understand the difference between relationship and fellowship. Can we say relationship, relationship. and fellowship? fellowship? Relationship is becoming a member of the family of God. This is the conversion process. We become a member of the family of God by faith in Jesus Christ. It is established by asking him to come into our hearts and to our life. And as John makes that clear in the last chapter of this book, chapter 5, and this was mentioned by Pastor Ranjit as well, he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So the Christian life starts right there with this matter of relationship. Relationship is accepting Christ, and fellowship is experiencing Him. So those are two different categories. Those are two different places. Relationship is accepting Christ, while fellowship is experiencing Christ. Brothers and sisters, you can never have fellowship if you do not have relationship. Correct? You can never have fellowship with God if you do not have relationship with Him. But it is possible that you have a relationship with God, but you do not have a fellowship with Him. Correct? Meaning, you can call yourself as a Christian. You are attending the church services. You are attending the ministry. You are very involved in the work of God. But you do not spend time knowing Jesus Christ. It's possible that you just become so busy and yet, the presence of God is something that you are looking for because you thought that this is how the Lord wants you to be. It all starts with your relationship and then second, to have fellowship, it is something intentional. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, relationship puts us into the family of God. But fellowship permits the life of that family to shine in us. I'd like to repeat that. Relationship puts us into the family of God. But fellowship permits the life of that family to shine through us. And this is what marks the difference between Christians. Fellowship is the experience of the presence of God. What is fellowship? I will just make it simple. When you say fellow and then ship. So it's two fellow in a ship. Which basically means something in common. Can you say something in common? You share. I mean for all of us to be in fellowship, we share one experience. We were once lost, but now we are found. 
We were once blind, but now we can see. We were once dead, but we are now alive. So this is our common. This is our commonality. Just like what Sister Andrew was saying, that regardless of your race, regardless of your language, we understand each other. The connection that we have together as brothers and sisters, it's because we both experience and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why sometimes if you are outside and then you speak with someone and then you ask him, and then there is something about this person. Are you a Christian? And then that person would say, yes, I am a Christian because that is the connection. Okay? So, fellowship meaning to have all things in common. When you have something in common with another, you can have fellowship with him. But if you have nothing in common, you have no fellowship with him. Let me tell you a funny story. My husband is also preaching today. So this is the first time that we are both going to be used by the Lord in the pulpit. My husband, he, Kuya Thomas knows him a lot. He also looks like sometimes people mistaken him as an Indian. All right. So he attended a wedding. It's an Indian wedding, but men and women are separate. My, me, my, my personality is I always seek relationship. Like, you know, I'm very proactive. You cannot just put me and, you know, be quiet. But my husband is a man of few words, okay? So anyway, he attended a wedding. And after that, he told me, you know what? In that hall, because men are separate from the ladies, he said, you know, in that hall, there were Kabayans. There were Filipinos, but they did not speak with me because they thought that I am an Indian. So those two Kabayans were not able to find that this is your Kabayan. There is something common in us. And therefore, he was not able to meet these guys. You see? Because the two Kabayans thought that the only common thing that we have here is we're attending the, the, the wedding. But there's more to their com commonality. They are from the same country and they speak the same language. And therefore, you can never have fellowship without relationship. There has to be an intent. There has to be an effort. And for us seated here, we have a common denominator. And that denominator is supposed to be in the upper, not denominator. But that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. So we all have things in common. Can you look at the person seated beside you and try to find, you know, it could be a commonality in language. If you're from Uganda, I'm also from Uganda, brother. You know, do you like Indian food? Yes, I also like the Indian food. There are so many things common in us. As human beings, there are so many things that we could relate to. We have triumph and we have defeats as well. We have experienced death in the family, and I'm very sure that you, we know this. This is something that we all would be going. I was hearing my sister there that she had a frozen cho shoulder. One month ago, I also had that. And while she is testifying, I could relate. I could feel the pain. But praise the Lord, I could also feel the victory. I could also feel the healing that God has given you. So there is an instant connection. You went through something, I went through that, and I also experienced the presence of God, the fellowship of Him healing us. So there is commonality. There is something common between me and you and you to your other brothers and sisters. But John here is talking about the unique fellowship which is only possessed of those who share life in Jesus Christ together. We have this different kind of life. It's a new relationship. So the scripture tells us to live together in, ter in tenderness and love toward another. Not because we're wonderful people, not because we're lovable people, and whether we admit it or not, sometimes our brother or sister could be annoying, right? There is something in him that, you know, doesn't match with you. But just the same, 
the Lord asks us to focus on that, the same thing, the commonality, and we are encouraged to love one another. And we need to have fellowship with one another. Now, we can never say that we are enjoying our fellowship or experiencing the presence of God if you are not enjoying your, the presence of your brother and sister. Hello? So you can never say, I am enjoying the presence of God. If we have something against or like if I do not want to sit beside this sister or brother, he is annoying. Brothers and sisters, you can never experience God without having fellowship with your brother or your sister. Amen? And the reason for this, while our relationship with God is vertical, myself and the Lord, yourself and the Lord, there is also such a thing as a horizontal relationship. If there is something wrong with your horizontal relationship, which is your relationship with your brother or your sister, then that would indicate that there is something wrong as well with your vertical relationship with God. Hello? Are you still here? So in order to enjoy and say that we are experiencing the presence of God, our vertical and our horizontal relationship, our fellowship with one another should also be enjoyable. I'd like you to look at the person seated beside you and say, brother or sister, I experience the presence of God through fellowshipping with you. Amen? So that is fellowship. So our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And then as we go on in our life, the horizontal relationship is, as we realize, is directly related to our vertical relationship. So as I was saying, if your vertical relationship with your brother or your sister is not right, then you can never claim. Yeah, I just have fellowship with God. I enjoyed His presence. The Bible so also tells us, right, when we worship, but if we have differences or conflict with our brother or sister, God is saying, okay, put down your sacrifices first. Please make sure that you, you, you make amends and fix your relationship with your brother and your sister. Now, the important question is, as Christians, having understood now that God requires those two kinds of fellowship, vertical and horizontal, my question is, are you enjoying your experience, your fellowship with God? Maybe today, there are some issues in our homes. Maybe we have conflicts even in our offices. We have to make sure that we always fix our fellowship with our brothers and sisters and only then that we could say that I have this right fellowship with God. I will enjoy and I am enjoying the presence of God in my life. Amen? Number three, maturity. Well, the whole context of this preaching is taken from 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. I have added 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 to 14 to complete the whole context, the progression of our experiencing and being in the presence of God. Can we go to 1 John chapter 2? Verse 12 to 14. It says there, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. 
Notice that this in this particular scripture, there are three categories there. One is children, right? So children here refers to newborn again Christian who accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and had relationship with him. And then it says there, young men. And then the last one is the father, okay? Can we add 14 as well? I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So maturity is all about exercising and growing in the presence of God. Let me just do a quick recap. Relationship is when you become aware or when you discover the presence of God. Fellowship is when you are actually experiencing the presence of God. And the third one, which is maturity, which is growing and exercising the presence of God. John described as young men are those who have overcome the evil one. And then he repeats it again. And he adds an explanation. He says there, I write to you young men. And then he added the reason. Because you are strong and the word of God, God abides in you. Okay? See, you are strong and the word of God lives in you. John puts that, the last uh, statement, because there is a secret um, ingredient there about our growth and exercising the presence of God. What makes one who is spiritual child to become a spiritual young man, what is that? What is that? The word of God. In order for you to progress from a child and to become a young man and to become a father, the word of God is needed for your growth. That is the key. So that is the secret of the growth. This is, the word of God is a design, divinely designed instrument. Because it's impossible for us to grow as a mature Christian without the word of God, unless the word of God abides in us. And that's what the devil is always trying to do. He does not want you to have that experience of fellowshipping, fellowshipping with God, and all the more, he doesn't want you to experience and grow in the presence of God. The devil has always been in that business. Do you remember in Genesis when he asked Eve, Eve there, like when Eve has taken the knowledge, the fruit of knowledge of, of good and evil, this is his question. He said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So Satan would always twist the word of God. He doesn't want you to reach in your maturity. Satan cannot stop you from having relationship with God. But he can definitely stall you from growing and exercising in the presence of God by removing and allowing you not to focus on the word of God. The word is the supremely important thing to move us into maturity. As I said, the devil would try to divert our attention. He will try to put a lot of destruction in order for us to reach that moment, that period in our life as Christians to become mature. He does not want you to grow. He just wants you to sit there and do nothing and take in, just take in the word of God, but does not allow the word of God to live in you and allow the word of God to be manifested and be demonstrated in our lives. So... He tries to divert our attention and get us off into spiritual sidetracks. 
He brings in certain apparent shortcut that offers us to bring us into maturity into an instant. Instant spirituality, instant maturity. That's why sometimes we are confused. Am I not spiritually matured? I'm already doing things for the Lord. I have 50 ministries. I am the driver. I am the cleaner in the church. I also am attending the praise and worship team. I'm also part of IP. But what we have to ask, are we spending, are we intent in making sure that we are growing, we are exercising the presence of God in our lives? Maturity is prevented by diverting attention from the knowledge of the Word of God. This is what the devil does. We can study the Bible, we can acquaint and memorize verses, but that is not enough. This passage, remember, says the Word of God abides. In other versions, the Word of God lives. This means a knowledge of the Bible plus the obedience to the Spirit of God. When the Scripture speaks of knowing the Word of God, it's not just saying that we need to know every word, that we be familiar with every word, every Bible Scripture. It is always the Bible plus the Holy Spirit. Amen? It's always the Bible plus the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible tells us that the Spirit gives life. I was reading the Bible prior to becoming a born-again Christian. I am helping in the church. I am a lector there, you know, in my old religion. But I was not having that really experience with God because it's all about performance. I was reading his word, but I did not know Jesus Christ. I was talking about Jesus Christ to people, but you know, it was just every Sunday, every time when, you know, when it's turned to say responsorial psalm, and then you read the gospel. But at that time, I wasn't experiencing, I wasn't growing in the presence of God because the Holy Spirit is not there. It is only when I truly became a born-again Christian that I met the Lord Jesus Christ that suddenly the Bible, the Word of God has given me a different meaning. It's not just a book. It's not just a set of scripture, but something that changes in my life. So in order for us to grow as Christian, we have to read the Bible and acknowledge as the Holy Spirit to empower us to understand what God is really saying in our lives. And that is a progressive presence of God, maturing, growing, and exercising the presence of God. So, if we really want to grow in the presence of God, experience Him, and allow that presence of God be obvious, be demonstrated, people can see it, we have to read His Bible, and it has to go in tandem with the Holy Spirit. And brothers and sisters, I know you know this. It will demand your time. It will ask time from you. The exhortation of the scripture, you need to be diligent and be diligent about searching the scripture, studying the word, and our desire to stay and grow in the presence of God has to be intentional. Can you say intentional? intentional. In the church... And I'm not sure if it's the same here. Whenever you ask people to join a ministry, almost half or maybe 90% of the members would go and join the music team. And only few 
would be joining the IP team. Hello? People would be very excited to join the music ministry. And in the beginning, I was like thinking, Lord, why, why it's like that? Why like that? <laughs> and so I was asking the Lord, Lord, how can we encourage a culture of prayer? How are we going to let every Christian know that prayer and interceding for people is a basic, fundamental principle in a Christian life? And people just think of prayer, ah, I'm talking to God. But to really put yourself in the presence of God, asking Him, telling Him everything, not only about yourself, not only about your needs, but also for others, it has to be intentional. And so as a pastor, I said, Lord, how can we resolve this? You know, for people to make a habit of prayer, you have to impose it. And so we launched this covenant of prayer every 9.30 in the evening. It all started after the Ta'al uh, volcano eruption, and then the Wuhan, you know, the Enkovi, and the situation here in the Middle East. I told the pastor, let's start with us first. Of course, we're going to have a meeting, you know, all of us together praying, but let it be a habit, a constant thing. So the pastor started the 930 prayer covenant. So wherever you are, whether you're still in the office or wherever you are, you have, once you set the alarm, I told them set the alarm at 915 so that by 930, all of us are aligned. All of us are going to pray for these points. And after probably two weeks or three weeks, I asked the pastors, how was it? And they enjoyed it because a habit has been enforced. It has something that was done intentionally to make sure that everyone is involved in that exercise of staying in the presence of God, in staying and growing and exercise in the presence of God. And now we have extended it to Bible study, and now we have extended it now to, for the entire congregation. So I told them, if at 9.30 you cannot, your, your, your uh, cell phone or your watches would alarm, then it brings you into prayer mode. It doesn't matter if others are still not, ah, okay, I feel this is obligatory. It doesn't matter. At least there is an intent until it becomes part of your system, until it becomes a habit, until it becomes a lifestyle. What I'm saying is that in order for us, in order for you to experience, to grow in the presence of God, to exercise the presence of God, it has to be intentional. We are all in the same page here. We have work, we have ministry, we have families. But in order for us to bask and to enjoy and to grow, and to become mature Christians, it has to be intentional. I have a question. Anyone here who is a father, can you raise your hand? Fathers, please raise your hand. All right, thank you. If your son tells you, you know what, Dad? I'd like to grow up like you, to be strong like you, Daddy. I'd like to be that. What do you tell your, your son? You know what? In order for you to grow like me and to be strong like me, every morning you have to put yourself, you stretch yourself, stretch your body until you grow. You have to think about growing every day until you experience or until you grow the same as me. Is that what you're going to tell your children? No. What you tell your children, your son, son, in order for you to grow, this is what you should do. You eat, you rest, and you exercise, and then you focus on what you're supposed to do as a young child. You eat, you rest, you exercise, you sleep properly, you keep healthy, 
and then you will grow. Is that correct? Growth is something that is natural. God designed for us to grow and therefore God wants us to grow in His presence. Hello? I want us after this service to be asking ourselves, Lord, where am I in that period? I have known you, Jesus, for 10 years, but have I really experienced and have fellowship with you? Oh Lord, I've been serving in the ministry, but have I been really growing in your presence? Growth is automatic. Whether you like it or not, if you plant a seed, it will grow. But in order to grow, there are conditions that you have to meet. The father said, son, you eat, you sleep, you exercise, and live healthy. And after some time, you will be like a man, like me. And so this is the same thing that we do as Christians. In order to reach that maturity, we eat, we sleep, we exercise, and be healthy. Eat well, exercise, sleep, and keep healthy. Now, we apply that in our Christian life. It's no longer daddy and the boy. We apply that in our Christian life. It is also equally true. The key, the key to growth is constant fellowship with the Son of God. If we want to become a mature Christian, we are able to take whatever comes. We're not going to be scared that there is a new virus spreading around. We're not going to be looking at people and, and blaming them for the offenses that they've made. But we give ourselves a time to grow. We stay in His presence and allow yourself to be grown by God. Allow God to mold you. Allow God to tend you. He loves to take care of you. Allow God to prune you if there are things that, you know, is not glorifying Him. Submit to God. That's why this morning when I was talking to Pastor Ranjit, I am really so blessed and so humbled that this year, this is your theme. It starts with humility. It starts how to sow yourself in righteousness and reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. You have to tell yourself, Lord... I want to be molded by you. I want you to tend to me. I want you to take care of me, Lord God. You are so pleased when a person comes to you broken and with contrite heart. If you want to mature, if you want to reach that maturity, that level of experiencing God, then we allow Him. So, in order to grow, what are the conditions the father said to the child? One, two, eat, and then rest or sleep, and then exercise. How do we do that? Eat Christ. We did that earlier, but it's just one-time event. We eat Christ every day by eating His Word. We grow in the knowledge of Him. We think, we talk, and communicate with Him on a daily basis. That's why that prayer covenant is designed to allow people to put in their lives, to put in their calendar that you have to talk to God, your Father. It has to be intentional. Whether people like it, you build a system, make it a habit so that every one of us can grow. Every one of us can have that presence of God manifesting. Hello? Hello? Can you tell the person sitting beside you, wake up! It's time to eat! Second, we sleep or we rest in Christ. We have to learn how to rely on His strength, not our strength. 
We have to live in constant expectation that it is working in you to do his good pleasure. I always say, all of us, at one point in another, we have encountered something that is impossible. An impossible thing is that you have done everything as a human being, and yet the situation is beyond your capabilities. The Bible tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And the Bible also tells us that um, work without faith, faith without work is dead. And so God has given us the abilities. God has given your will. So for me, I always believe in my heart, I will do all the best thing possible that a human is capable of doing. Hello? But for things that I know I have no control of, for things that for me is beyond my capability, I give it to God. But it does not excuse me from doing what I am supposed to do. And prayer is that. We do not know. Like this virus, no? It is spreading. The numbers are increasing. And from one country to another country. And every night we pray about that. And the Lord would reveal every aspect of that. And so we were praying, we were praying. We we're praying for the country's people affected. And then one night, that was last night, the Lord says, you are still praying for this. But don't you notice that I am moving. And even in this thing, there is something good that will come about it. And so our prayer has changed last night. It's all about thanksgiving to God. And then we see the confirmation that the cases are decreasing. A lot of number of those who were infected are recovering. You see, when you are in constant presence of God, you hear Him. You hear Him. He responds to you. So that is how we rest in Christ. And one, what did the father say to the son? Exercise. Can you do this? Exercise. Man, when are your muscles? You know, one of the pastors said, you know, faith is like a muscle. But if you don't exercise it, it's not going to grow big. Hello? We have faith. Even that came from God. But if you're not going to exercise it, it will never grow. What did the Bible says how to make it grow? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So how do we exercise? We exercise by serving Jesus, obeying him, by moving out, by taking on things to do. We open our eyes and step out to meet the world, to meet the needs of people that call out all around us. We hear the cries of suffering and anguished heart and the lonely and the discouraged. For us to grow in the presence of God, we have to exercise. People need to see it. The moment he sees you, ha! Huh, I can see the presence of God in your life. It is because you allow it to manifest. Do you remember Moses in uh, Exodus? After meeting God and he had a tablet, you know, the Ten Commandments. When he came down, you know, his face was shining. The Bible says his face was shining. The glory of God uh, allowed him for, for his face to shine. And so when he went down, Aaron and the Israelites were afraid of him. You see? Once you spend, the more you spend, the more time you spend with God, the more of his glory is revealed in you. Amen. Hello? And there is this song. I'm almost done. There is this song that says, and, and which my husband and I will love it. And the lyrics is, uh, 
I want to take your word and shine it all around. But first let me leave. I'm just checking the, the, the correct lyrics. It says here, Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. For when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. I want to take your word and shine it all around. But first help me to just live it, Lord. And when I'm doing well, Help me to never seek a crown, for my reward is giving glory to you, Lord. We take the word of God and shine it all around. This is the key to maturity. We eat Christ on a daily basis. We rest on him. For things that we are unable to do or to solve, we give it to the Lord. We give it to Christ. And then we exercise. We represent Christ outside the four corners of this church. This is the picture of maturity. Where you can say, I am growing in the presence of God. I am exercising. I am demonstrating the presence of God. In my life. When we do this, we will overcome the evil one. He cannot get us. And bit by bit, we become like Christ the most attractive, the most fascinating, the most compelling personality that ever lived. The more you stay in the presence of Christ, the more that He is illuminated. In our lives. Earlier on, Sister Andrew led us in the breaking of the bread. And this is included in my preaching today as the Lord provided. This is what the Lord had in mind when he instituted this supper. He said, taking the bread, this is my body which is broken for you. What do you do with the bread? What did we do earlier? We ate it. And therefore, we are to eat Christ. The breaking of the bread and the communion is not just a symbolic form. But we are to take him in and feast upon his strength in the spiritual sense. We have to live our life on the strength which he provides. This is what the Lord's Supper is all about. And it is growing in his presence. Brothers and sisters, the Lord wants us to answer him. If you had been born again, if you haven't become born again, the Lord is asking, are you willing to discover my presence, then enter a relationship with God. But if you've been a born again for some time, the Lord is asking, I want my presence to abide in you. Please have fellowship with me. Please call me. Please ask me to be with you every day. And then the last one, my son, my daughter, my design is for you to grow and exercise and demonstrate my presence in the world. So come. Come to me. So those are the three things. Whatever stages you are now, I believe in my heart that the Holy Spirit has convicted your heart. And the only way, the best way, there's no other way 
but just to respond to that. All of us are asking, I want to feel you, Lord. I want to know, Lord, how come I cannot feel you? How come I'm not in your presence? God has been there since the beginning. And our progression of that relationship will be based on us. Why? Because God has already done His part. He already made His known, His presence. 